verse 386. As the waves in their variety are stirred in the ocean, so in the Alaya is produced the variety of what is known as the Vignanas. So the ocean and its waves. The previous verse started talking about this and it's the theme of this verse and the next few verses. The ocean and its waves that conjures up a rather picturesque image. But these waves are massive and they come crashing down, breaking the water up in all directions. And as enlightenment practitioners, this is what we have to swim through. I tend to see it though not so much as waves, as whirlpools, vortices, which once we enter their vicinity, they suck us down. So as enlightenment practitioners, as soon as we get ejected from one of these whirlpools, we swim around. We head for the deep waters where it's stiller and hopefully steer clear of other whirlpools. But it's unlikely. We'll get caught up again and sucked in. When we get sucked in to one of these whirlpools, it's confusing, it's disorienting. We forget ourselves. We forget our enlightenment practice. The only thing we can do is not add to the power of the whirlpool and eventually it will wear out its force. So what are these whirlpools? What is this ocean that we are swimming through? Well all of this is consciousness. It's all our awareness. And you kind of wonder, well, why should awareness give itself such a tough time? It's rather like, though, the prism which refracts white light into the colours of the spectrum. Only in this case, consciousness is its own prism. And it needs to behave in this way so that it knows it's here. Perhaps we can argue that this is why in most cases for most people life is so difficult. We're constantly getting these wake up calls to realize the true nature of our own sentience, of our own awareness. So this supreme awareness, this supreme consciousness, it's the only consciousness in fact which is at the heart of our own being. It's what is hearing this. This alaya refracts itself into what are called the vijnanas. And we can understand this as sensory experience. Because what is awareness normally aware of? It's aware of sounds, sights, tastes, touch, feelings, smells. That's what it's aware of. The senses and what happens when the alaya, the pure, this pure awareness, is refracted through its own prism. And this prism is the discriminating mind. So these are the vijnanas. And this is the theme of the next few verses. Verse 387 says, the chitta, manas and vijnanas are discriminated as regards their form. 
that in substance the eight are not to be separated one from another, for there is neither qualified nor qualifying. So this is describing the work of us, the Enlightenment practitioner. We appreciate what's going on here. There's the chitta, which in the previous verse was called the alaya. There's manas and vijnanas. Vijnanas, as I mentioned, are the senses. And normally we say there are five of these. But there's also the world of our thoughts and imagination. The mind is the sense which apprehends mental objects. So that's six. And there's also the mind which thinks about all of this, which gives these senses a particular reality and says, these senses are what is real. These sense objects are reflecting something external to me and they're what is real. So these eight, the chitta, the five senses, the mind, the sense that perceives the mind, and also the discriminating process, we are told here that they're not to be separated from one another. For there's neither qualified nor qualifying. And it's actually this discriminating mind that makes a separation. It's actually the prism of consciousness, which is no different from consciousness itself. So neither qualified nor qualifying. Qualifying means you're saying that something is like this or not like that. And what you're qualifying is the qualified. So I see a video camera and I say that is a video camera. Well, that's the qualified, the video camera is the qualified. And the process of saying that that's a video camera is qualifying. But it's saying here that there is no qualified nor qualifying because this is simply the prism of consciousness in operation. And you think, well, if you go back to the usual understanding of a prism, there's the light and there's the, the rainbow, the spectrum on the other side. The light is just doing its thing. As far as the light is concerned, the prism doesn't come into the picture. As far as the Enlightenment practitioner is concerned, we're not interested in the prism. It might seem a bit strong to say there's neither qualified nor qualifying because there clearly is qualified qualifying but not from the perspective of the realization of the chitta. Not when you come back to this pure awareness, realization of this pure awareness, realization of awareness. When you come back to it, when you successfully practice, it's at this point when you're successfully practicing it's at this point that there is no qualified nor qualifying. So that's why I say that this verse is about enlightenment practice. And verse 388 consolidates this. As there is no distinction between the ocean and its waves, so in the chitta there is no evolution of the vijnanas. And the evolution of the vijnanas is this belief in the reality of this sensory world. So the previous verse was about enlightenment practice and this verse here is about being established in this practice. There's so much important stuff going on we have to give priority to stuff in the world. This verse is telling us otherwise as enlightenment practitioners 
we wake up from this dream, the dream of the world. At some point this dream is going to end for all of us. And yet we give it such importance. We give it such importance. Never mind the nature of the dream, just get on with it. No time for navel gazing. More important things to do. This is the evolution of the Vijnanas. We must give awareness back its proper place. Chitta. It's the central, primordial, only fact. This is the true center of our being. We come back to this realization. As enlightenment practitioners, we keep coming back because there's always this pull into the evolution of the vijnanas. These are the whirlpools of consciousness. And this is what's spoken of in the next verse. Karma is accumulated by the chitta, reflected upon by the manas, and recognized by the man of vijnana. And the visible world is discriminated by the five vijnanas. I would say here the visible world is discriminated into the five vijnanas because it's actually the manas that does the discriminating. Chitta is sometimes called alaya, and alaya means the store consciousness. Consciousness has infinite potential, infinite modes of expressing itself an infinite variety of prisms. And each of these prisms is what's called karma. I don't know if you can get a variety of light prisms, but here there are an infinite variety of prisms so that consciousness will get refracted in a particular way. And when it gets refracted in a particular way, we've got what's called the individual. You, me, everybody else. All these individuals seeing the world in their own way. They've forgotten the nature of the awareness that's being refracted. And they're getting on with the evolution of the vijnanas. So there's all these senses going on. There's all the stuff in our head. And there's the process of discrimination going on. In accordance with the basic psychological disposition. The basic karmic prism. So I hope that spells out this situation clearly enough. The situation of all these apparently different consciousnesses and the work of the enlightenment practitioner which is to realize that there is only this one consciousness.